we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. Plenty of evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited. And these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me, we're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Thanks for inviting me into your home, your long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM, the very best in late night talk radio. I'm Richard Serrett, and tonight, this morning, I'm coming to you live from my home studio in old Thornhill Village, just north of Toronto. American author and screenwriter and avid sportsman Max Hawthorne returns to coast tonight. Max is known as the Prince of Paleo Fiction. Think Michael Crichton meets Peter Benchley. But instead of a great white shark terrorizing beaches and coastal villages, imagine an enormous pliosaur an extinct large carnivorous marine reptile from the late Jurassic period, which manages to survive the extinction event that wiped out most of the dinosaurs. Of course, the pliosaur is extinct. Well, probably, we hope. But there are still plenty of gigantic creatures with sharp teeth still lurking beneath the surface of the world's seas and oceans and even freshwater lakes, rivers, and ponds. Some of them we know about, Great whites, killer, uh, killer whales, saltwater crocs, freshwater gators, goliath groupers, enormous squid, some of which, according to legend, were large enough to drag large sailing vessels beneath the waves. And some creatures are simply harrowing uh, eyewitness accounts of encounters with what can only be described as sea monsters. Max Hawthorne has written about all of them, He's researched and written academic papers on some of them. He's talked to eyewitnesses who've encountered some of these mythical beasts, and he's even grappled with some. Gators, groupers, and sharks, that is. Max Hawthorne is an American author and screenwriter. He's referred to as the Prince of Paleofiction. He's best known for his Kronos Rising series of sci-fi suspense thrillers, which have garnered both Book of the Year and People's Choice Awards. He's the Amazon number one best-selling author of the cryptid research book, Monsters and Marine Mysteries, as well as Memoirs of a Gym Rat, an outrageous expose of the health club industry, and the children's book, I Want a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas. His song, A Tyrannosaurus for Christmas, peaked at number two on the 2021 World Indie Charts. In addition to being a best-selling novelist, Max is a singer-songwriter, a vocational paleontologist, cryptid researcher, IGFA world record holding angler, and a voting member of the Authors Guild. Max is an avid sportsman and conservationist. His hobbies include archery, fishing, boating, boxing, and collecting fossils and antiquities. He lives in the greater Northeast with his wife, daughter, and a pair of enormous Siberian forest cats who, when they're not stalking Max's toes, sleep on his desk as he writes. His two latest books, Cronus Rising, Purgatory, Sun, Sand, and Slaughter, book your timeshare now, and just in time for Christmas, The Slay, a nail-biting supernatural suspense thriller. It's Christmas Eve. Pray he doesn't come down your chimney. And uh, this latest book uh, features a cult of serial killers the press calls 
the Christmas Cannibals. Christmas Cannibals. You heard me correctly. Max Hawthorne, welcome back to Coast. How are you, my friend? I'm awesome, Rich. Thank you. How are you? Very well. And we will get to the Christmas Cannibals all in good time. Um, But I want to talk uh, some uh, sea creatures with you. And um, I have to, I have a confession. I don't know my pliosaurus from my plesiosaurus. Explain the difference. (laughs) Um, Well, actually, pliosaurs are plesiosaurs. The plesiosaur group includes the long neck variety, which people think of when they picture Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, you know, the long neck, the small head, there's four flippers. So if you picture that type of body with a short neck and a large crocodile-like head, you'd basically be figuring what a pliosaur looks like. And and the creature in the Kronos Rising series is a pliosaur, correct? Yes. The uh, the principal, the primeval protagonists, I like to call them, are a species of uh, pliosaur that I actually designed for the novels. But yeah, they're uh, kind of like a apex predator type. You figure the long neck ones are designed to eat small fish, like the size of their head. And the ones with the huge jaws were designed to take down large prey items that they could bite apart and, or swallow whole, depending on size, et cetera. And because you're a, a a boxer, I'll use the uh, the phrase "tail of the tape." Give us the tail of the tape on the pliosaur. Well, uh, I mean, you have such fragmentary fossil remains. Uh, I have a collection of cervical vertebrae, centra, in my display case that suggest an animal between forty three and fifty two feet in length. I have a single larger one. That's about 15 or 20 percent bigger than that. Um, but you, Lord only knows. I mean, uh, Eberhard Frey, the paleontologist who discovered the monster Aramberry, which is a I think a four, 13 or 14 meter specimen they found in Mexico. That animal had been killed by a much larger pliosaur, and he said that it had uh, punctures in it, one of which suggested an animal with tooth crowns, meaning fangs, uh, 12 inches or more in length. So since that animal only had five and a half inch fangs, the one that was killed, and it was about 40 or 45 feet long, I would imagine one with 12 inch fangs would be considerably larger. So time will tell. So, <laughs> so the this pliosaur would have been unmatched as a predator in the ocean during what, the late Jurassic period, correct? Uh, they ruled the seas from the Jurassic until about 90, I think it was 90 or 91 million years ago uh, in the Cretaceous period. Cretaceous period, okay. Mm-hmm. And so in the Kronos Rising uh, series, and I know we've we've gone through this before, but for people not familiar with uh, this uh, series of books, explain how your pliosaur in Kronos Rising survived uh, the, the great extinction event and in, in, into modern times. Oh, that was the thing. Thank you. That was actually my favorite part of writing the book was coming up with a plausible explanation of um, how these animals could be alive to the present and without having been seen. That's always, a, you know, when people are talking about cryptids, they're always concerned, well, where are the bodies? How come they're not showing up, washing ashore, that type of stuff. So what I did, I wanted something unique and plausible is I envisioned these animals um, having what's called a, a mating chase. Uh, during mating season when a female was an estrus. Uh, So there was this cow, we'll call her, uh, that was in heat, for want of a better word, and was being pursued by a large group of male pliosaurs that were all vying for the rights to be her mate. And they would do a chase instead of fighting it out where the strongest one that survived would rule the day, I guess you'd say, or went over. And as this was going on, the asteroid that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs um, slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula about a thousand miles from where these animals were. The resultant mega tsunami that came up from that swept up them and a whole ecosystem of ocean along with them and enveloped a caldera, an oceanic caldera, which is basically a volcano that millions of years prior has had its entire top blown off via a violent eruption. So all that's left is this bowl-shaped depression, kind of like Crater Lake, for example, was a caldera. So this 1,000-meter-high tsunami swamped this caldera and continued on its way as part of the impact caused by the asteroid. Um, It turned that caldera, 
which in the book is eventually called Diablo Caldera off the coast of Cuba, into a gigantic eight-mile-wide saltwater aquarium, depositing within it, like I said, an entire ecosystem. So there was a few pliosaurs that survived this, as well as all sorts of other prehistoric marine creatures of assorted sizes. So these animals that survived were imprisoned in this caldera up until the present, and would serve them well, because besides shielding them from the impact winter that was caused by the asteroid impact, you know, the all the grit and debris blocked at the sun for months or even years, they stayed warm via what's called geothermal heating from the dormant volcano. And eventually, in the present, that caldera split open, at least temporarily, and the ocean wash rushed in and a bunch of what was in there escaped. Hence, the surviving, at this point, the obviously the population had varied over all those eons, but the sole surviving animal had escaped into the Atlantic and began to explore and work its way up the uh, seaboard coast of Florida and doing what any apex predator do when it enters a new environment or ecosystem. It looked to feed and establish territory for itself and possibly mate, et cetera. Hence the, uh, and that's how the whole story came about. Chronos Rising, chronosrising.com, the website, check it out. Uh, is it within, I hasten to ask, or, or actually I, I hesitate to ask, is it within the realm of possibility that there are still pliosaurs or creatures like the pliosaurs still swimming around in the, the depths of the ocean? Well, I mean, there have been dozens of reports from people ranging from 100 or 200 years ago, all the way up until the most recent one I'm aware of, I think is in 2017, where people have claimed to have seen or encountered gigantic marine reptiles of some kind that don't match anything but something from the Mesozoic. Uh, the last one was the Carnival Cruise Monster is what it ends up being called. And this was reported by a gentleman from the UK who was working on a Carnival Cruise ship. And he was brought, called over to the railing and people were pointing down at this gigantic thing swimming along next to the ship and they asked him what it was and he couldn't say it but he described it as being uh, having a an enormous like it was very very dark colored smooth skin it wasn't a whale it wasn't a shark it was too big he said it had a head like an enormous alligator super broad neck broad shoulders and just the part he saw which was the head the neck and part of the back was 50 feet long and he was comparing that to their 37 foot lifeboats that they have you know you could see so whatever, he couldn't see the rest of the animal, but it could have been 100 feet long or more. But he described it, it made it seem like it was an enormous pliosaur or mosasaur or something. So um, are these sightings, the um, the ones that they seem to be describing, like a giant leatherback turtle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that, well, that wouldn't be the same type of animal, but there have been a, a lot of sightings of those. Um I documented that in Monsters Marine Mysteries, including I got to interview uh, the a gentleman named Earl Stoziger, who, along with Gary LaMotta, who became famous for this, Gary passed away years ago, but uh, they saw a 38-foot turtle off the coast of Canada there that was uh, either hunting fish or frolicking in, in, in the water, but uh, it stuck its head and neck up out of the water and looked at them, and just the head and neck was eight feet long, and it looked like a gigantic turtle except that it didn't have a shell it was like more slim huge front flippers small back flippers very fast moving that sounds a bit like a pliosaur doesn't it yeah but the uh the thing is interesting thing was the actual head and neck when i was able to i spoke to um, gary's widow and i got permission to use a few frames when i enhanced them you could see the head and neck was sticking out of the water and it was in this case an enormous turtle of some kind you can see the eyes deep set and the beak edges and the chin and the throat flaps, the skin and all that. It's quite jarring to think that there could be turtles out there the size of a bus. Um, so something is attacking and taking big chunks out of really big, you know, great white sharks. Mm -hmm. is, is, is the culprit in this case, um, do you think a killer whale? Some people think that the megalodons are still swimming around these huge prehistoric sharks, or or could this giant um, sea turtle, mm -hmm. uh, predatory sea turtle, be the culprit? Um, I haven't seen any evidence of the the turtle attacking something that's managed to escape. Uh, the stuff that I looked at most recently. Um, has indicated, I mean, there's a difference between a shark bite and an orca bite. 
like sharks tend to excise a chunk of fish. I mean, I'm sorry, flesh, like kind of like Pac-Man taking a bite, you know, or a cookie cutter type thing, chomp. Um, killer whales have teeth that kind of dig in and then they rip. It's more, the head is more lizard shape, we'll call it, and not a circle in terms of the bite pattern. So you could definitely discern between one and the other. Right now, I'm finishing up a documentary on a, uh, a humpback whale that washed ashore this past July and uh, near Briar Island. And it had several bites on it that were shark bites that are a yard across. And uh, this looks like this animal was actually wounded by like a small ship or a large boat. It had a lacerations on it from a prop injury that had also shattered its scapula on the right side. And I believe that made it slow enough. It was wounded enough that a huge shark bite that could catch it and finish it off. And it has, um, so there was one enormous bite on the caudal region, like the tail right in front of the flukes, and another on the flank near where the wound was that was caused by the propeller. And uh, the attacker, I mean, going by, it was presumably a white shark. That's what it looks like. One of those ones that they talk about where they suffer from gigantism once in a while and just keep growing. But uh, you're using the most conservative, the last one branch formulas out there. The shark was at least 32 feet long that attacked this whale. So that's, that's wow. a pretty big rewrite. Yeah. 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 Um, but wasn't there a, uh, and I think we talked about this before, there was a great white that had a radio transmitter uh, attached. They were tracking it. And, wow. uh, and that, yes. And all of a sudden, the, um, the transmitter, the signal went way, way down deep, deeper than great whites normally go, mm -hmm. uh, as if something had gotten a hold of this great white and took a deep, deep dive. What was yeah, that? That was, that was uh, there was a couple of specials that were done on that called the Super Predator, Hunt for the Super Predator, that type of stuff. Um, it's It's been a while, but the uh, shark's name was Alpha, and she had a, a satellite transmitter attached to her dorsal. And like you were saying, she all of a sudden disappeared, and then her transmitter popped up or washed ashore, I should say, sometime later. It had evidence of acid etching on it from something's digestive system. And when they got the data from it, it showed that she had made several very deep dives, including the one where she was killed. I believe the prior deep dives were indicative of her being pursued by something and diving deep to escape it. Uh, great whites will do that to escape killer whales. For example, we know that like when one, one of their kind is killed by orcas, they'll dive deep and they'll take off. Orcas don't apparently go down 1,500 or more feet. Uh, it's not their uh, shtick, shall we say. But uh, So in this case, she was diving deep and she got caught the last time and consumed by something. And when you look at all the evidence... Uh, there, there was, for example, there was temperature on there, you know, body temperature, the attacker, compared to the surrounding water, um, how long it was in the digestive system, and where the animal was swimming after Alpha was killed. And the uh, some people w were saying that it was just a larger great white, like she was like nine or ten feet long, and a 16-footer got her. Other people were saying a megalodon came up from the abyss and killed her, and ate her, went back down, and all this other stuff. But None of that made sense when I looked at all the data. Uh, first off, if the the data showed that there was a huge temperature jump between the surrounding seawater and the stomach temperature of the attacker, and that range exceeded that of what a white shark was capable of in water at that temperature. I think the water was 40 degrees. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have all the data in front of me. And I think the internal temperature was maybe 76 degrees or something like that. But... Um, it didn't match up for a shark in terms of the differential. They're like, they had limited like a 25 degree jump in the stomach temperature versus the surrounding water. Then you had a, the animal was swimming um, after it ate her from the surface to around a 300 foot depth, which was indicative of behavior similar to a killer whale, which suggested it was an air breathing predator, something that likes to surface regularly for air and so forth and so on. So that didn't make sense in terms of it being either a, another white shark or a, quote, megalodon. And, of course, the idea of a megalodon coming up from the abyss didn't make sense because we know from the tracker that she was near the surface when she was attacked. She dove down deep. She got consumed. And then the attacker went back up to the surface. So if it was something that lived in the abyss, why would it be chasing her from the surface down to the abyss and then go back up to the surface and stay there? Uh, I mentioned in the, the introduction uh, that you have um... – 
Siberian forest cats. Do you still have the two or you or do you have one now? Oh, no. <clears throat> Believe me, there's two. And I've got the uh, my door to my office barricaded to make sure he, one of them can't get in here because he was trying earlier. But, yeah, we have uh, two of these big boys. Their names are uh, Mace and Olaf. My daughter's pride and joy, both of them. And uh, they're they're awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just, you, you know, people think like, a lot of people think like uh, animals are like people or have people personalities and stuff, but sometimes they do. I mean, the, the things these two characters throw my way, it's like like uh, Olaf, or, there's a huge scratching post outside my office for these guys. It's like four feet tall. They're big cats. And Olaf will see me walking towards my office and he'll rush across the great room and jump up in front of this thing and stand up and start like scratching at it, show up how big he is and powerful he is and all this stuff. And I'm like, look at you, you're such a big boy. And then he screeches, he goes, and then takes off like a rocket. I'm supposed to chase him through the house or something like that, like a game. You know, and I'm like, I'm too old and fat to be doing this. <laughs> Thank you. Are they, are they good mousers? Oh, well, we don't have mice in the house, but um, any insect or arachnid in here. Uh, I mean, I saw mace take a, a fly in a three foot leap right out of the air. Another, you know, another time there was a, a house spider in my office, and he, I guess they're smart. They know what, what something is venomous versus not. He took his talons and he just like, slap, 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 and kept jabbing it until he was sure it was fully dead. And then he ate it, of course. You know, but yeah, they're, uh, they're predators. I mean, they're, they're wild and. And Russia and such, they're arboreal. They hunt in trees, take down birds and frogs and lizards and stuff like that and all that. They're, yeah, impressive animals. All right. So we were, before the break, talking about what ate Alpha, this 10-foot great white shark, when its uh, tracking device washed Mm -hmm. up on shore. Whatever ate it and digested it went down about 1,500 feet, and you sort of were going down the list of what it wasn't that ate it. It wasn't... Uh, uh, you know, the legendary Megalodon. Uh, and w- maybe if time permits, we'll discuss whether they might still be around or not. It, it wasn't likely a, an air-breathing, did you say it wasn't an air-breathing creature or it might have been? Well, the, the evidence that I was able to collect based on the documentaries and such indicated an air-breather that stayed near the surface or 300 feet or so down for eight days after ingesting the shark. And then, of course, the tide was excreted. So it had a slow digestive system, and it was capable of great speed. It was capable of diving deep. And I I checked my records. Um, The water temperature was 46 degrees, and the super predator's stomach temperature was 32 degrees higher than that. So what was interesting is when you look at this list of potential um, predators, super predators that could have done this, I mean, whales are out because their body temperatures are similar to ours. Like an orca has a human temperature, that's 90 degrees. Um, that's the first thing. Then you need something that's fast enough to catch a fleeing nine-foot great white, which could probably swim at like 30 miles an hour at that age and that size. So that's another thing. But you also need something that's an air breather and that has a very slow digestive system also and that body temperature. And so the more I look, I mean, squid are out. That's, they're, they have a body temperature similar to the water that they're in. They're cold-blooded, basically, animals. And when they eat something, they rip it to pieces with their beak, and then they have a tongue that's like a file that shreds it even more. So nothing would get through there and intact, including a tracker, would have been destroyed by a squid, for example. Um, So when I was looking at all this stuff, the only thing that seemed to make sense eventually, which of course made no sense, was a leatherback sea turtle. Because there's a scientific paper out there that shows a leatherback was exposed to temperatures, cold water, and it maintained an exact 32 I'm sorry, Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit differential between its body and the cold water it was in, which is exactly the differential the super predator exhibited as well. So that was interesting. Leatherbacks are also air breathers. They're also fast. They can swim at 22 miles an hour for the regular ones, and they can dive extremely deep, 5,000 or more feet, and they travel near the surface, et cetera. Um, but they also have a slow digestive system. Their digestive tract is five or six times longer than even other sea turtles. So when I put all this together, it it sounded like a leatherback, which of course made no sense because they eat jellyfish and sharks would prey on them or try to. But when we see like uh, Gary LaMotta and Earl Stoziger, you know, filming that giant turtle, then of course, then you start to wonder people seeing a turtle 38 feet long is big enough to consume a nine foot shark fast enough, could dive deep enough 
and if it had the same type of metabolism, let's say, as a leatherback, would have the same temperature differential. So everything seemed to point to the, a giant macropredatory or piscivorous turtle, which is what I theorize the super predator is, based on, obviously, all the information that I was able to glean. Wow. A leatherback turtle the size of a bus. Right. But uh, not a, an actual leatherback. Because they, Gary said that it was... It didn't have a shell. It was slimmer. So it was built more like an enormous sea lion, but it was a turtle. And when I spoke to interviewed Earl about it, um, he said when they looked down at it, because their two boats were hovered above this thing, and it was sitting like 30 feet below them on an uprising of rock there that they were looking down at. And it was very pale, so you could see it clearly through the water. It was almost white, like a very pale gray. And at first, he thought it was a gigantic sea lion. But then they realized it wasn't, of course. And when you look at the film, you could see the turtle's face and stuff. And uh, But he said it was every bit as big as his boat, which is 30 feet long, which is how they were able to gauge its size and stuff. And, you know, he said it was quite frightening. He was afraid he was going to service and, like, capsize their boats. But, when you start – when you research this and, 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 and write about it, does it ever give you – pause to, I don't know, go snorkeling or scuba diving? Are you afraid to go in the water? Do you ever scare yourself into going into the water? <laughs> well, I, I try not to, you know. I mean, these these years, I mean, nowadays, it's like if I lie on the beach, people try and roll me back into the water because they think I'm a beach <laughs> whale. <laughs> I get it, you know. They're starting to throw buckets of salt water on me. Then they start putting things in my blowhole to try and get the sand out. You know. But, um, you know, I mean, I had one embarrassing incident when I was in my 20s and I was like surf fishing. I was like in water, like chest deep. And, uh, you know, I, I had hooked a shark or no, I didn't hook it. It was like following my lure. And then it like uh, when I stopped reeling, it submerged about maybe 50 feet out. And then a second later, a crab grabbed my ankle and I I screamed like a frightened schoolgirl through my fishing rod and ran on water all the way back, you know, to shore. And all that because I thought the shark had grabbed my my foot. It was turning to be a crab. But uh, no, I mean, I, I, I swam in Hawaii with sea turtles and dolphins and all that. I mean, you know, I like to keep an eye out because you don't want to be caught off guard if there is something, you know, coming your way. But no, it's all good. Uh, I know you spent a lot of time in Florida, and we've talked about uh-huh. your encounters with with alligators. Uh, oh. You were telling you were telling me that they are now so prolific that. If mm-hmm. there's any body of fresh water, that could be a pond on a golf course. You're pretty much guaranteed there's a gator in there. Is that true? Well, that's what people believe. Um, I'm going to tell you what the population is right now. Let's see how many alligators there are. Well, in Florida, there are 1.25 million roughly and 5 million across the southeastern United States. So that's a lot of alligators. But uh, wow. people will say, like, you know, if you have a fresh you know, body, I mean, how many times do people come outside and find a gator in their pool? You know, yes. it happens constantly, and they have to call to have them removed and such. And by the way, Olaf is clawing at my office door trying to force his way in here as we're talking, the cat. But um, speaking of alligators, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, I would be very careful and cautious. So I think there was a thing even in the news recently where a, a burglar broke into somebody's house. I think it was in Florida, and he was the police were looking for him. And he went into a local pond to try and hide, and then he got killed by a twelve foot alligator. Wow! So, yeah, you know, it's uh, you don't want to go skinny dipping down there. You know? What's what's deadlier? Uh, uh, let's say a, uh, I don't know how big freshwater alligators get. What fifteen maybe at the the top twenty? Yeah, there? I think the the males usually t- get bigger than 12 feet, 12, 13, maybe 14 feet. I think the world record is 18 and change, but that was a long time ago when right. they weren't, you know, hunted by people or, you know, such. But uh, what would you deadlier. fear? What would you fear more? Uh, a 15 foot alligator in Florida mm-hmm. uh, or a saltwater croc? Where is the saltwater croc? <laughs> No, like saltwater croc. Well, let's say it's a, a, a comp- the same, a r- roughly the same size. Which one would be a, a more fearsome predator? The salty. Every no, no question. Much faster, ten times more aggressive, and often target people as a food source. The alligators tend to shy away from people. I guess it's learned behavior or such. But uh, 
you know, they're a little slower, not as aggressive. I mean, they're predators, don't get me wrong. But salties are bigger, badder, faster. It's, you know, like if you look at a husky versus a wolf, you know, that type of thing. One's a little right. more civilized than the other. There's a um, a picture on your website, and it's chronosrising.com. There's a gallery there, and you have landed – a, a something called a Goliath grouper. It's 200 pounds. Um, but as Goliath groupers go, is that medium, small, or is that a good size? Uh, it's a small adult, actually. I just like that picture. Um, that's the grouper, that particular grouper stabbed me in the ankle with his dorsal spine. So even though I'm smiling, my ankle was pouring blood. It's all over the deck. I think they might have, I don't know, that photo, they blotted it or blacked it out a little bit or something like that. But uh, I think the largest one I've landed that we brought on the boat for pictures and such, back when you were allowed to do such things, was a little over 400 pounds. But I lost one literally at my feet next to the boat that was at least eight feet and probably 600 pounds. It was big enough eight to eat a person. Eight feet. It's big enough to eat a person. Would they? Would they eat a person? They have made attempts in the past and if you're i mean i know people like for example in australia that have told me there are regions there where they have grouper and potato cod which is like another type of grouper they're also big and parents if they're waiting in the ocean they they hold their children up and they're constantly looking around worrying about that if you fit in the mouth these fish that's what they swallow their prey whole basically whether they're eating a small shark or a barracuda or anything that fits in that huge bass like jaw is going, they're going to try. And that's why I tell people like, uh, if you're, you know, people say, Oh yeah, I was swimming along. I was snorkeling and this giant grouper came up and was looking at me because they're such curious creatures. And I'm like, they're not curious. They're measuring. Understand? <laughs> I mean, you're slow moving. You're like a perfect meal, but you're too big. They're like, so this fit. Well, they, I'm not really sure, you know, but, and the, the, the worst part is, is everybody thinks they're like a bass in terms of, you know, how you can lip a bass with your thumb and all that, yes. you, you know, by the yes. jaw. You can't do that with the grouper. They have teeth. I mean, the upper jaw teeth are like the teeth of a tiger shark and the lower jaw teeth are like hook spikes. And I, I fished with my first grouper guide and he showed me on his forearm, he had this giant scar that went from his wrist to his elbow, giant semicircle on both sides. And I'm like, what is that? And he goes, oh, 300 pounder, he's taking the hook out, bit me. And I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yep. Took the meat right off the bone. I'm like, wow. Oh, what did you do? He goes, well, I canceled the charter, of course. I'm like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> and of course, then he goes, I wrapped it up with duct tape. I said, because duct tape fixes everything. He goes, exactly. And then I called ahead to my wife and all, and she was ready to take me to the hospital. When I got to the dock, he goes, I, I took the tape off. I showed her, and she fainted right there. Boom. At the dock. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, he literally, she fainted. It was like, this, you know, everything was ripped right off and all. I think he's, I don't know how many, 340 stitches, something like that. It was insane. So, and, so uh, you're very careful with the business end of these fish. I'll say. But, I mean, how do you avoid them? Like, are, are, are they everywhere in the ocean? Grouper? Uh, no, yeah. Goliaths are, I think, uh, more eastern seaboard and Caribbean, stuff like that. They used to be terribly endangered. I mean, because they're not afraid of people because of their size and whatnot. And so spear fishermen used to slaughter them in the 50s and 60s. They'd swim up and just shoot them like they were a cow and then hang them on the dock. And then it was terrible. You see all these old photos of these 500-pound fish just being killed and hung up and probably not even used for food. You know, not a fan. I actually wrote a piece that was in, I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was Solar Sportsman or the other one, but, uh, you know, def- defending the grouper because they were going to, like, kill a whole bunch of them uh, for a study on how old they were. So, like, and it was totally unnecessary. So, anyway. Um, I have a, um, a niece, and she moved to uh, the Congo the Democratic Republic of Congo, and she married a boxer over there. She lives over there. And uh, and then I was on um, – uh, I mean, it's a dangerous place. Um, mm. But if that's not bad enough, like the Congo River has – like the river monsters in there, they have something called – I think it's called a tiger fish. Mm. Uh, I mean, the fangs on that thing are just – it's yeah. they're so big, they don't even look like they fit in its mouth. 
uh, would a tiger, like, are they like piranha? If you weren't swimming in the Congo River, would a tiger fish eat you? Well, I mean, a tiger fish, you know, I, I mean, I'm talking about the, uh, the Goliath tiger fish is the really big one. There's smaller ones, and there's those monsters like that you see, like Jeremy Wade catch and stuff, you know, river monsters. And they get yes. big. I mean, I'm sure one is capable of killing a person. Um, like, God forbid, if you were swimming and you had like a shiny silver necklace on, they thought it was a bait fish and struck at it or something like that. I don't think they would target something the size of a person. But then again, who knows? Anything happens. I mean, they get preyed on by crocodiles themselves, but, uh, you know, big crocodiles, obviously. If you're a six foot fish with a mouth and things like that, you know, a small croc might be on the menu. But uh, I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I've never heard of one killing a person, but I guess anything is possible. I mean, it could even happen accidentally with jaws like that, you know? Mm, boy, I may never go in the water again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can add singer songwriter to your, uh, your vast repertoire of talents, Max. Well, you, you've done this previously. You had a, 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 a song um, that accompanied your um, uh, your children's book, uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex for Christmas. Um, how, is this a is this a new uh, thing for you, singing songwriting? Have you always been a singer? Uh, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I was in the uh, church choir and a cantor, and I was in the Philadelphia Boys Choir, believe it or not, for a couple of years. You know, in wow. junior high, but um. I, it, it, for me, it just comes with being a writer I mean, poetry and lyrics for songs are, you know, pretty much the same thing. It's just a matter of getting beat and rhythm down, et cetera. And I, I put together a great crew of people that I work with to produce the songs that I write and all that. So, uh, you know, a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas was, uh, it was, it was, it was a, it's, it's a really nice song. It's actually at, uh, number 23 right now on the world indie chart and the Lope to Rising song. Uh, for the sleigh is right behind it at I think 25 last I heard. So they're wow. clawing their way, clawing or gnawing, depending on if you're a T-Rex with those little hands, I guess you'd gnaw them with a claw, but uh, <laughs> up the charts and stuff. So yeah, good stuff. Well, I want to ask you about killer whales. I'm fascinated by killer whales. I, I, I'm, I'm very thankful that they're, they're, you know, they're not going to be uh, kept in captivity at, uh, at sea world or um, what is it we have here in Ontario? Um, a marine land. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's just, to me, it was just unconscionable that we would keep these magnificent creatures, you know, in, in these little tiny uh, fish tanks, essentially. But how, yeah. how intelligent are killer whales? I think that they rank up there with, uh, they're probably smarter than chimpanzees, let's put it that way. I mean, their brains are enormous. They're organized. They're family units. They're emotional creatures. I mean, you know, you've probably seen some of the footage, like they took a, a mother's calf away from it and it screamed for like two days straight or something like that. You know, they're very loyal. I mean, there was the one in the news where the moms in the in the wild where the calf had passed away and she carried the body around for like a week straight or something like that, you know, unable to let go. But uh, I, I think they're, as, as cetaceans go, I mean, they don't have, let's say full tool use, but they're, I think they're emotional, they're intelligent and they don't forget things either. They don't forget things, meaning would they hold a grudge? Oh, I'm sure. You know, there was a, uh, I don't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. I didn't come prep for that question, but uh, this is going back probably in the fifties or sixties or something like that. But uh, off the coast of Canada, there was a particular pot of orcas that had, formed like an alliance or a friendship with some of the whalers there, locals, who these people didn't have like uh, whaling ships per se. They would hunt whales using small boats and harpoons and such, but they, the orcas would actually go and call the people like vocally when there were baleen whales in the area and they would rush out, jump in their boats and follow the whales and the orcas would show them where the baleen whales were and then they'd make their kill and then the, they would let the workers eat what they wanted, and then they would take the rest of the whale 
to bring it back and process it, et cetera. And this is a repeated thing where the whales were intelligent enough, the orcas, to know that the people were better able to kill these bleeding whales with our technology than they were, and they didn't have to risk anything. They were just acting like bird dogs. There's your, the whale. You take care of it. Okay. And we get to eat what we want. And then, you know, it was this sort of like a partner. And this went on for decades until the whales that were in the founding group got old or passed away. And then eventually, or the people that they were dealing with passed away. And then they split off, stopped doing it. Wow. Remarkable. Remarkable. Um, I don't know if you, I was reading or actually it was, I think it was my son. He, he loves to look up, you know, one of my, my two boys, well, both are very curious and they're always looking for interesting stories and sharing them with me and my, my wife at dinner and breakfast. And one of them was telling me about how dolphins, um, they will, they'll, um, they'll capture a, a puffer fish and uh, they'll, they'll kind of, you know, play with it, use it like a, a soccer ball. And then I, I'm not sure if it's the puffer fish that excretes, a toxin. Oh, the toxins. Yeah. As they're getting like snorting it, kind of getting high on it or something. Yeah. 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 I, I've seen some, some footage about that. You know, workers are actually dolphins themselves. They are the largest species of dolphin, which is ah. kind of interesting because they do eat other dolphins or almost like a little, like a cannibalism thing or something. Hmm. They also uh, use their flukes and toss them in the air like a hundred feet when they smack them around and stuff. Wow. So, Yeah. They can be a little sadistic, like people sometimes. Right, right. Um, weren't the, the killer whale, getting back to the killer whales, uh, weren't they, um, they, take, they were taking out the, uh, the rudders on, on fishing boats because they were doing damage and they were just like almost like, you know, uh, little kids, not kids, but teenagers stealing hubcaps or something. They were going around and taking out all the rudders on all the fishing boats. Oh, is this off of Europe? I forget where. Yes. The area. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was actually because what's been happening is, is the trawlers there have been taking all the fish and the, the orgas have nothing to eat and they're getting more and more frustrated. They're starving because people are consuming all of the fish taking and they're being left with nothing. So they're kind of like fighting back, I guess you'd say. I mean, they're big enough and powerful enough to sink fishing boats like that and kill people. Um, they're not going that route but they are trying to drive people out of the territory or at least, you know, be, a, be respected enough that they are allowed to have food. I mean, I think that's fair. You know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So they, they've actually figured out, okay, let's, let's just sabotage these fishing boats and uh, then we won't have as much competition for the fish. Uh, they're amazing, yeah, they're, they're, amazing creatures. Yeah, they're, they're really, I mean, they tailor their hunting tactics to whatever species they're going after. It varies. I mean, they've been known to, use uh, like huddle up in like a wedge formation, for example, and push a huge wake of water to knock a seal off an ice flow into the water. Uh, they, whatever they need to do, they'll do it. They use bubbles. They use you know, the different organized hunting strategies for different animals and such. They're very ingenious. That's what, when my first novel, Cronus Rising, I actually had it where my, this 80 foot pliosaur, which was the size of a huge whale, was become such a threat that they three pods of orcas joined up together, formed a super pod to try and take out this threat to their families, et cetera, and all that. But the problem was that they had never dealt with an animal like that before. Pliosaurs are, you know, swim with those four flippers. They're used orcas are used to animals that swim with tails, you know, caudal fins, flukes, whales, sharks, things like that. So something with four wheel drive was different for them and it proved problematic as the uh battles let's say on un- unravel or uh, whatever so four-wheel so, drive yeah late in the morning here for me so i'm kind of my brain starting a little fuzzy You're not <laughs> no no no, no. uh well speaking of the four-wheel drive and and here's something else we add to your incredible resume and that is i mean you you're uh you write scholarly papers on uh, so for example i think you wrote a, a, a paper on the the uh the locomotion um, oh, uh, of these pliosaurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the only paper that I've, I've for, um, wrote, written so far that's out. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, I come up with a theory for solving the mystery of plesiosaur locomotion that had eluded paleontologists for, I don't know, 150 years or something like that. And, uh, you know, I was so fired up about it that I decided, you know what, I'm going to have to teach myself how to write a you know, a scientific paper and do it. 
you know, and I partnered up with a couple of paleontologists, Mark McMenamin from Mount Holyoke College and Paul de LaSalle, who is a famous fossil hunter and, and paleontologist from the UK. And uh, yeah, I wrote it and they worked with it also and we put it out there. And peer reviewed in the whole nine yards, right? Oh, it's been, been uh, it was peer harassed is more like it. <laughs> oh, really? You caused a little bit of a stir, did you? Well, I don't think that people, like, how can I say this? When a layman comes in out of nowhere, you know, without a crust a degree or anything like that, and starts to, you know, solve problems that people that do this for a living and have these college degrees and stuff like that in it, you know, I, I mean, like, I'm not saying people are full of themselves, but I think people sometimes are a little unwilling to accept help from somebody with what they, they look down their nose at you, let's say. And but the truth of the matter is, is that nobody else, I don't know why, couldn't see it. Honestly, I mean, you've got these prehistoric marine reptiles that were around for over 100 million years, and this locomotory mode of theirs, this four wheel drive, you know, was like so obvious that, that it was all four paddles were being used for a reason, but nobody could figure out why. And I have like uh, nephews who were, uh, when they were in college, were champion scholars. And I, I was trying to figure like how these paddles would move together, et cetera, to generate extra thrust. Because there had to be a reason. I mean, when you look at sea turtles, they use just two flippers. You know, the front basically is for the locomotion. Same thing with pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, all this stuff, front flippers. You know, the rear stuff is more for a little maneuvering and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you have these four flippers, so how could they work together? And the problem is when you have these paddles that push together, like that, and they push through the water, you don't get a significant increase in speed. When I looked at like uh, the world records for sculling, if you took a one person skull, meaning two oars, one person, or a two person skull, which would be four oars, there was only for the world records, like a 12% increase in speed. And that's because you have the paddles pushing through the same water. See? So the one in the front, is pushing the one in the back, the water's already moving. So the second set of paddles doesn't get as much oomph, let's say. That makes sense. Right. It's just, pa pushing it's paddling it. through froth, basically. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's a great, way to, they call in, in sculling, they call that the principle of, uh, well, I call it, they call it the principle of diminished returns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, uh, that, that was a problem. Like it didn't make sense to have that, all that muscle and power. And it was obvious that all four, flippers were being used for locomotion. I mean, some paleontologists are saying, oh, the, the front flippers are doing all the work and the rear were doing uh, steering. And I'm like, but they're like the same size. Sometimes the rear ones are even a little bit bigger. You know, that would be like a ship having rudders that were like the size of a giant sail. And it wouldn't make any sense. All that mass and power designed for stamina and you're going to just direct traffic, you know? And so right. there was all these different ideas out there. Oh, it's a figure eight. Well, the front set went first, and then the second set went while they rested and all this other stuff. But what I realized was, was, and I was sitting in a hot tub, I think, when this happened, I was moving my hands together through the water and trying to figure it out. How is this working, working, working? And then it dawned on me that the front set were pushing like a sea turtle or a penguin kind of down and back, and the rear set were pushing more parallel to the seafloor, like laterally pushing back. Kind of like you, right. if you and I are swimming, and our arms are doing a crawl stroke, but our legs are doing a flutter kick. You see what I'm saying? Right, They're right. both generating thrust. And either one could work, but you put them together, you get the maximum speed. So then I said, well, if this is true, then there should be some anatomical proof of this. And when you look at all the skeletons, and I went to a couple of museums and obviously a lot of imagery and stuff like that, you see a couple of things. You first of all, you see like the tilt, like the shoulder girdle kind of tilted upward and the pelvic girdle girdle tilted like up towards the i'm sorry the the from the front it tilted upward towards the head and in the back it tilted the opposite way towards the vent so that showed you that the pelvis was kind of angled down whereas the front was developed up i mean pointed up so those flippers would have moved a little bit differently there and then i noticed the ribs and the ribs in the front where the shoulders were let's say were adaptively shortened to make room for the flippers to be able to move but the ones in the back the adaptive shortening there was like there was no ribs. They were like tiny little stubs. Like a sea turtle has that big arch in the front of its shell so that the paddles can go way up, you know, to, when they move. So this was showing that the rear paddles could push laterally with power 
to a much bigger range of motion than the front ones could. You know, nature doesn't like bones to be in the way. That's why our ribs, as they get further down, they get shorter and shorter, so we can twist at the waist. Right, okay? right. So the same type of thing. And that was all the evidence I needed, you know, to show that this is what was going on. And then when I looked at other papers, so like the Carpenter paper, they were talking about how when they were looking at the different couple different species skeletons, the rear joints there and the hips and stuff were showing this unusual range of motion. They didn't know what it was. They thought it might have had to do with steering, but it wasn't. It just cemented my theory, which was that you put all this together, pelvic tilt, no ribs, and that extra range there was designed for that pushback. So you've got these rear paddles pushing straight back, like boom, boom, boom. And the front one's doing the mainly the changes of direction and also power as well. And you put all that together, you get like a 50, 60% increase in speed instead of just 12% like you would in sculling through the same range of motion. I'm sorry, I'm brilliant. Rambling, but that, yeah, that's how no, no, no. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's brilliant. And you discovered it just like Archimedes while you were, well, he did it in the bathtub, you were in the hot tub. Uh, so did yeah. you grab a towel and run around the apartment or the, around, run around the house saying, Eureka, Eureka? I jumped up. I was not wearing anything, actually, but I was home alone, so it was fine. And I ran through the house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and scared the cats to death. Actually, we didn't. <laughs> so if you like what you hear from me tonight, this morning, and uh, uh, maybe, just maybe, I can interest you in checking out my podcast, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. New episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And if you want to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to think about a premium subscription. There are three subscriber tiers to choose from. You get access to my back catalog, commercial free listing, a free subscription to my monthly newsletter, discounts on merchandise, even an exclusive monthly Q&A with me over Zoom. To get your premium subscription, go to strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right, Max, just enough time to tell us uh, how we get a copy of Kronos Rising Purgatory and The Slay and uh, the brand new single, Lopter Rising. Uh, well, Lopter Rising is streaming now, so you can get it obviously through Amazon or anything else like that if you want to acquire the song. There's two versions. There's the clean version we play. There is an expletive version, which has one word in it, which is, you know, not horrible, but obviously we won't talk about it on the air. Um, but you can catch it streaming, you know, all, I, I have a great music manager, Stephen Wrench, who used to manage Leonard Skinner. So he's really awesome and props to him. Um, the books and everything, all my stuff is all available on Amazon. So you go on amazon.com and you just look me up, Max Hawthorne, or you look up Cronus Rising with a K, uh, it's there, or you guys can go on my website, maxhawthorne.com or cronusrising.com, same thing. And there is a free books page there where you can do a lot of downloads. There's a paleo gallery. And, of course, all the data, excerpts, et cetera, from all the novels is on there for people to check out as well. Max, always a pleasure. Thank you so much, my friend. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I can't thank you enough. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.